We're going to have a look at Psalm 33, Psalm 33, if you'd like to turn to that, which I've called Sing God's Praise. Listen to it as I read it. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with a harp, make music to him on the ten-stringed lyre. Sing to him a new song, play skilfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purposes of his heart through all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and keep them from famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. A prayer. Please, Lord, speak to us through this psalm. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Many, many years ago, having lived in England for 35 years, our family went to America. In fact, we went to the Deep South, to Dallas. Now, up to that time, I thought I understood what a sandwich was. It was two layers of buttered bread or two layers of a bun, and in between there was meat or cheese, some kind of filling. But on our first trip to America, boy, was I in for a surprise. The bread, the bread alone was so much thicker, and the filling was absolutely enormous in between the two slices of bread. So much so, it was so big that they had to put a stick through it to hold it together. And they put an American flag on the top of the stick. Now, uh, Psalm 33 is an American sandwich. The bread alone is worth chewing on and the filling is excellent. Just look at it with me. First of all, we have these opening three verses one to three, about singing, singing God's praise. Sing joyfully, praise the Lord with a harp, sing to him a new song, play skillfully. We are to sing. We are to use all musical instruments we can get our hands on. Now that is matched from the beginning to the end, where from 20 to 22, we now wait in hope. We wait in hope for the Lord. He's our help and shield. In him our hearts rejoice, which you would do with music usually, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. We start by singing God's praise and we end by rejoicing in hope. Now those are the two thick slices of our bread. We sing joyfully as we give the Lord our praise and we rejoice together as we wait in hope for the Lord. So if the chewy bread is likened to our singing and rejoicing, I wonder what's in the middle. Well, it isn't so much that the singing is good, it's what we sing about. Yes, as I say, we use all the musical instruments we can with the aim to praise the Lord, because we've got a new song to sing, we're told in uh, verse 3. A song the world knows nothing about. We want to shout it out joyfully. We want to say our God is great. 
Our God is beautiful and all righteous. There's no one like him. In fact, as we tuck into the other slice of bread, we put all our hope in this God. We know him by name. He's called the Lord. Did you notice the capital letters through the psalm, particularly at verse 20? Capital letters, his personal name, Yahweh, the God who is always there, always present. There's no one like him. We trust him. We enjoy him. We jump for joy that he's coming back for us. All our hope is in him. Ah, you say, but tell me more about that filling. What's in the middle of the sandwich? What are we to sing about? Well, it's the word of the Lord we're to sing about. Look at verse four. Four. Here's the reason. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. This is our nourishment. This is why and what we sing about. For this is the reason. We focus therefore on the word of the Lord. The scriptures are our source of knowledge of God. How do we know the truth of what God is like? Well, he tells us. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He uses his personal name, the word of the Lord, in connection with our singing, our praise. Our source of truth is in the scriptures. Without such a revelation from God, not only is his word true and right, but he himself is true and right. He's faithful in all he does. You see, without this word from God, it would all be guesswork, wouldn't it? Oh, we might say it's a good word, but we wouldn't know if it's true, would we? We wouldn't know if God was true. How would we know if he's faithful? How would we even know him? Only because the scriptures tell us, the word of God tells us. That's four and five, isn't it? For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does because the scriptures say so. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. Now look what the word of God describes for us. First of all, it describes the character of the Lord. He's faithful in all he does, verse 4. He loves righteousness and justice, verse 5. Now these are called covenant or faithful words. He keeps his promise. You see, as scripture tells us about itself that the word of God is true and right, that matches with God himself who is right and true. He is faithful. He speaks truth. He keeps his word. God loves right living. He loves right thinking. He loves honesty and justice. And this earth, by the way, is full of it. Now, you might not notice that so clearly because you might see the imperfections. You certainly know inbuilt human desires, which are not always pure. But is there not within us that desire that we want people to speak the truth. Where does that desire come from? We want people to keep faith. The desire comes from the fact that we were made, are made in the image of God, still in us, distorted it may be, not in perfection, but that's why, we're, why we still find right living here on earth, because we are creatures made in the image of God, longing for God's faithful protection. The word of the Lord describes the character of the Lord. Secondly, the word of the Lord describes the creative ability of the Lord. Here we are at six to nine. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Their starry hosts by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. This is God, our creator. Now, no doubt, the songwriter here has Genesis 1 in mind. Doesn't it ring true of Genesis 1? For he spoke and it came to be. The heavens were made by the word of the Lord, the starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters into sea and he puts the deep into storehouses. Yes, it's reminiscent of the first chapter of the Bible. But the emphasis here is on the trustworthiness of God. Or we could put it another way, the firmness of his creation. Did you notice at the end of nine, he spoke, 
It came to be, he commanded, and it stood firm. No, God does not need a second run at his creation. He does not create by trial and error. What he says, he does. He is firm in his word and deed. And this goes parallel with his unfailing love. He will be faithful to his promises in his word. For he spoke and it came to be, you see. He commanded and it stood firm. Because God is like this in himself and in the way he made the world, what do you think is the, is the appropriate response from this world? Well, I think eight tells us, doesn't it? Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. Now, just think about this for a moment. We live in a world where the law of gravity holds all over the world, where the sun rises and falls in a pattern everywhere around the world. As Christopher Ashe in his commentary on this psalm puts it, the waters of chaos are held at bay and evil is restrained. He gets that from number seven, gathering the waters and putting the deep into storehouses. So we can live comfortably here on earth. It's got its patterns. We understand them. We know where we stand as the earth rotates. We know how to treat others. We're not animals, we're humans. We still retain our dignity and value. And the reason we believe and generally have a moral order is because of this powerful word of our morally loving and faithful God, says Christopher Ashe. You see, the word of God holds up the creation of the world. It describes his creative ability, his sustaining of the universe. Thirdly, the word of the Lord describes the plans of the Lord. Look at 10 to 12. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. He rules over the nations, you see. That's what these verses from 10 to 19 are going to tell us. Once again, we see he's the Lord. Capital letters at 10, capital letters at 12. His plans are tops. There's no one like him. In his goodness, the creator has not left this world to run on its own. He's not the watchmaker who winds up the watch and hands it over. No, the world runs not without him, but with him. He is a God who plans and purposes, and these plans are worked out in his daily sovereign love. That's why at 10 he foils the plans of the nations. All rebellious plotting of rogue nations will one day be put down, because our God frustrates evil and promotes good. Now, maybe we don't see that so clearly from our perspective. We live in a world where wars are going on, where one nation is trying to overpower another nation. But one day we will see it. That's why we agree with this song, particularly at verse 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. Now, that could refer to the nation whose God is the Lord as Israel. That's true. But it could also refer to any other nation. We used to have high Christian values because we had a strong belief in our creator God here in this country. You see, the word of the Lord describes the plans of the Lord. Fourthly, the word of the Lord describes what the Lord sees. Look at 13 down to 19. From heaven, the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place, he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. God sees all, you see. From heaven, he looks down on all mankind. The Lord, capital letters, 13. 
Now, does this remind you of anything? God looking down. Didn't he do that in Genesis when they built the Tower of Babel? They thought it was great. They were getting taller and taller, bigger and bigger, puffing out their arrogance and building this wonderful tower to get up to heaven. But it was tiny. God had to, as it were, peer down and look down on them. Here were proud humans trying to run their own show. Now, when God looks down today, what does he see? Well, we're told he watches and considers. Verse 15, he considers everything they do. From his dwelling place, 14, he watches all who live on earth. His eyes are everywhere, we're told. What does he see? Well, he might see humans trying to do as they please. That's the result of sin, isn't it? We think there are no consequences. But that isn't true. God will act. Maybe some country thinks it can overpower or terrorise another one. Maybe one people group think they can do that over another people group. But it won't escape God's eye, will it? 16 and 17. Because it's not armies that win battles. It's God who wins battles. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. The horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. Of course not. God is the one who changes hearts and minds and turns people around. God watches over all. See that, 18? The eyes of the Lord are on all those who fear him. Yes, he watches over all because of his covenant love, his promised love, his faithful love. And he rescues those who fear him. On those whose hope is in his unfailing love. That's the covenant word, unfailing. Furthermore, 19, he delivers people from death. Now, don't you think that is absolutely brilliant? Where else can you find such eternal security? Who else rescues you from death? Where else do you find a Satan crusher and a death defier? These promises, says Christopher Ash, are as firm as God's word. That's why when you get to read the story of the birth of Jesus, you meet Simeon and Anna. And they are old, but they're waiting in faith. How could they do that? Well, they kept trusting in God's covenant faithfulness. They knew that one day fulfilment would come. And it did, in Jesus. Do you know that? Fulfilment comes in Jesus? Uh, I go to church uh, most Sundays, every Sunday really, if I can. I preach sometimes, and I sometimes sit in the congregation. And one of the reasons why I go to church is not just because of the coffee. I am a coffee lover, and I like nice coffee, and that attracts me to some churches, and less so to others. But the reason I go is to reorientate my thinking, or one of the reasons, is to focus on my creator and redeemer. You see, I need to constantly cultivate a lifestyle of rejoicing in God and his goodness. Oh, you say you could go and walk in the hills. Yes, I could. You could go and sail off into a gorgeous sunset. Maybe, but not without God's word. You see, I would have no way of interpreting what I see in the sunset or up in the hills. No way of knowing that life could be safe. My privilege, your privilege, is to open our Bibles every day and to get scripture stuck into our heads. And then we come to church to hear it expounded. Now we happen to be believers with the New Testament. So far all we have said would be true of an Old Testament believer, a Jewish person. But the New Testament pushes us a bit further. Because the New Testament word of God tells us that Jesus will return. And we are to wait in hope. Here's 20 to 22. We wait in hope for the Lord. Yes, we hope in God that one day he will be proved true and right and evil will be overthrown. All believers should therefore sing his praise with all available instruments. Why? Because the word of the Lord not only refers to the written scriptures, but the word of God who took on flesh and stepped into his world and brought down the rich saving power of God to earth. And we are still in the middle of his saving work. One day he will return, and on that day the rescue will be complete. 
In the meantime, there is work to do. We must join Jesus in multiplying his rule. Evil still reigns, and many, many of our friends are caught up in it. Yes, we are to wait in hope. Yes, we are to rejoice. Yes, we are to trust in his unfailing love, all with great confidence. But we don't just twiddle our thumbs and do nothing. We work our socks off to honour the rightful ruler, our King Jesus, to rescue people who are trapped in their own world, their own sins. Those who have not yet discovered the joy of singing God's word, of rejoicing in Jesus. You see, the meat in this sandwich is great. The word of God is rich in all that it says. But the bread is tasty too. Singing his praise and trusting his promises in hope to come to fulfilment. By the way, did you notice in verse 21 that God is looking out for a people who will trust in his holy name? We trust in his holy name. Did you notice that? In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. I wonder if that is you. You sing the praise of God, you sing of the great hope of Jesus' return, you trust in his holy name. I wonder if God sees that about you. Does God see you singing his praise? Does God see you waiting in hope and trusting in his name? Are you waiting in hope for Jesus' return? Do you live in awe and wonder and worship of him? Is your trust in Christ and in Christ alone? Let's pray. Thank you, our Father, for the joy of singing your praise. Thank you that you've shown us in Scripture the sort of God you are, the way you are redeeming this world and changing us. We do love you and we want to live in true fear of you. One day when Jesus comes back, please help us not to be ashamed. Trust you every day, talk to you, honour you, please you in every way. And if we've never trusted you before, help us to do so right now. To put our trust, our faith in the Lord Jesus, our rescuer, the one we live for, in hope. In your great name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching and listening.